you can have a Greek body with a German mind, something like that. Uh, I finished medical school, so I'm uh, a doctor by definition. My first specialty was in human genetics, and my second was in hematology, oncology. So I pretty much combined both fields, clinical and laboratory as well. And recently, I, become the, I took the achievement to become a qualified person. Uh, this means that you actually test the quality of production of medication, but as well as you test the good laboratory practices of laboratories in all Europe. So let's see what we are going to see and be familiar with in this presentation. So I assume that what you know about cancer is uh, the typical story, as I would love to say, is that when a patient suffers a cancer, uh, we have a tumor. When the tumor is localized, we say that the tumor is local, we excise it, we put chemo, radiation, or any other kind of treatment, and we hope that this is enough, and we deal with this once and for all. But if the disease is spread either to lymph nodes or to a distant organ, then the situation is difficult. And our chances for treatment is limited, not zero, limited. But then we have to deal with a much more severe situation. The patient is actually multi-treated uh, on, uh, let's say, on specific treatment problems. Actually, we are going to change all this by knowing and understanding what is the cancer physiology, whether the disease is actually start as a local or it's a systemic from day one, how the disease is progressing, and what is the actually driving mechanism and what is the driving entity. Because I assume when you say tumor, you deal with a lump, and you consider that the all lump is one entity, and it behaves in the same manner to all its extension. So we're going to see here that many of those, what you know, is actually assumptions, and they are not too true. Actually, they are by far not true. And what? are the recent achievement in order to deal with this disease once and for all. And whether this is achievable today or it's going to become in the near future. So we are going to see the cancer physiology. We are going to give definitions because we say cancer-free. Remission and cancer-free are two different things. When we say that I cannot detect by an MRI, a CT, an ultrasound, a tumor doesn't mean that the tumor cells are not there. We're going to be familiar with terms so that they are critical, like the limit of detection. Every test that you're doing on your life, they have a limit of detection, which means that they can see from a a point and after, not from below that point. Which means that below that point when the disease is there, your measurement is not able to detect it. And this is critical when you deal with cancer. When we say diagnosis, what do we actually mean with that? And how accurate we are in our clinical practice? how we do the treatment decisions. Because after all, it's not rocket science. We may hide behind difficult terminologies, but the old process and algorithms are relatively simple. And what are the statistics? And of course, we are going to be familiarized with the entity which actually is responsible for the cancer progression, the disseminated tumor cells, or otherwise, circulated tumor cells, definitions around them, what kind of technical issues we deal with them, what is the utility of them, and how we are going to apply them in clinical practice, and what are the future perspectives. <coughs> Let's start with the basics. How we define cancer?
because a lump doesn't mean it's cancer. It may be a benign. When a lump is able to constantly grow, it doesn't die. When it invades to the healthy tissue, which is around this lump, and whether this tumor attracts the formation of new vessel so that the blood supply comes towards the tumor, so that the tumor will be fed by nutrients and oxygen, then this tumor is defined as malignant. So immortalized cells able to metastasize are the critical definitions there. In the laboratory, we have one more term, but this is by far not relevant with, with you, so I'm not going to familiarize you with that. But in practicality, we need to take a specimen from this tumor, and when we put it on an animal model, which is immunocompromised, this animal, the tumor needs to regrow in the animal exactly in the same manner as in human. This is called orthotopic model. Only then we are sure that these abnormal cells are defined as malignant. But this is for the laboratory purpose. So we are going to stay on the definitions that Professor Weinberg has correctly defined. And if I ask you, what is the cause of cancer? I'm pretty much sure that 90% of you, you are going to tell me it's mutation that actually caused it. Am I correct? Yes. Anyone else that has a different opinion? Uh, well, actually, this is not the, the cause, the mechanistical cause, but it, your lifestyle, your environment, the viruses, the radiation uh, are actually causing damages. But these damages, most of the time, we consider that exist on the DNA level, so it means mutations. Well, think again. Because we have seen malignant cells without specific mutations that they have abnormalities on the RNA level. And the RNA is reversely transcripted to DNA and becomes part of our genomic DNA. We have, of course, the mutations. We have abnormal proteins without altering their sequence. As you can understand, the proteins are actually, imagine them as a string, a big one, which actually folds. And it needs to fold in a specific way so that this protein becomes functional. If this folding is different of the normal, it gives either switch off of the activity or overactivity. We have seen misfolded poor proteins which can actually cause malignant phenotype without the presence of mutation. And of course, recently everyone is talking about a new category of RNA called microRNA, which regulates the expression of genes and the alteration in the pattern of microRNA can cause cancer. So as you can understand, it's not only an issue of genome, but the abnormalities exist on all levels of biomolecules. 